This is a video wall panel that I recently took out of a kid's toy. It was out the Project MC Squared handbag of all things. A pink plastic handbag that had a genuine piece of video wall in it so they could display fancy patterns on it. Not only that, but it came with this really nice diffuser that goes over the front to protect it from spatter, whatever kids get up to, I'm not really sure. And the interesting thing about this is... I, th I was expecting this to be quite fancy and have processors on the back and be able to store images and memory. It's really not. It, it relies on another, pro another card to do that in the each video wall block. So to test this, I've written a piece of software for a PIC 16F627A microcontroller. And the only components I've got here to test this are the microcontroller and just because it, it, you know, it ticks the box, a little 100 nano decoupling capacitor soldered underneath across the power pins. So this thing uh, is quite power hungry, it takes up to 2 amps. And I'll demonstrate it. So what this is going to do is going to display the full walls of colour to check the LEDs. Then it's going to display a colour bar chart. Then it's going to pulse. Uh, pairs of these lines and the reason it's pulsing them is purely to test the output enable function of the shift registers and then it's going to test the MOSFET packages that scan the lines because you have to multiplex this display continually to make it display an image so it'll scan the lines down so I'll show you that running now so the first thing that happens is it displays red, green, yellow, blue, magenta, cyan, white and then the colour bar and then it's going to pulse the output enables, which is affecting two lines. And then it's going to scan down all the row drivers. And then it goes back to the beginning, starting with black and then doing the red, green, yellow and blue thing again. And interesting things that are worth noting about this uh, circuitry is it really does... Uh, it. It really is dumb. It's not like the WS2812B addressable LEDs that you can basically send, and those, they, they self-address from the first row. And you can send them an image complete with multiple levels of intensity, and it will just, you know, even if you disconnect the data after that image has been sent, they will store that image, and it will just display it continually. This is so different. I'll turn it off because it could get a bit annoying very quickly. So what we have in the back here, we have basically LED drivers that are shift registers and you have the display is divided into two sections it's got the top eight lines and it's got the bottom eight lines that's why there's always uh, two lines lit at once and when you send the data into this you clock it in you present uh, red green and blue for the top half and red green and blue for the bottom half as a simple on and off there's no intensity control in this uh, that has to be done by pulse of modulation which has to be done by refreshing the display at very high speed and alternating which pixels are on or off during each refresh cycle it's quite complex um, but we've got the red green blue data comes in here and it gets shifted across the display and you've got uh, two things to shift it across you get the clock pulse and each time you clock it it nudges across one led at a time but it doesn't display it at that point in time whatever was last being displayed will still be displayed while that's happening so you fill it up with uh, 32 uh, sets of the red, green, blue data to drive the LEDs. And then once you've clocked those across, you then trigger the latch. And the latch latches that in and then it displays it. The output enable is used for blanking the whole panel. Um, to display the data, you load in the first line and then you send, uh, you've got three lines coming to this one. It's got eight multiplex positions that basically represents the eight lines here and the eight lines here and you basically send it three binary bits and those three binary bits get converted to uh, a single one of eight output because the three binary bits can represent eight different values and that drives these MOSFETs and each of these MOSFETs drives one of the rows so in the case of uh, me displaying these solid walls of colour, all I'm doing, say for instance a red, I fill out the shift register with red LED channel only by clocking it 32 times and then latching it with just the red bits enabled. And then to actually display it, you then have to cycle through those lines. So it's displaying the same line of red, red data each time to give the full wall. For the uh, colour bar effect, it's actually just as simple, but you clock in first... Uh, you clock in the black and then the 
I'm trying to remember the colours, red and green and yellow and then the blue. But you clock them in four steps at a time to create the colour bar across it. I'll make this software, I'll, I'll put a link to it down below, I'll put it on the website so you can look at it. It's written in assembly code, uh, machine code, as it used to be known. And uh, you basically create that bar and then scan it down. For the other effects, for the toggling of the output enable, I just fed in a line of white, um, enabled the top line, which is just uh, resetting to uh, the binary selector to zero, and then toggled the output enable, and then I cycled the uh, binary through the binary sequence to actually make it light each light line with a small delay in each. And uh, it's actually quite easy to implement. But uh, I'll show you that running again uh, while I get this chip ready to put in because then I decided to do something more sophisticated. I should explain that to deal with the amount of data you have to put into this to keep the, the speed of the refresh up, what they do is they have a load of these modules on the front of a block video wall block, and then they have a process in the back that is apparently based around full programmable gate array type logic. It's the something. It's pure logic that they can have a memory that they can put a copy of the image in, and then it just batters through that at really high speed, sending very high speed da data out to this to actually multiplex and keep it running independently of the actual the source of the data. So I'm going to put this chip in now because this is my attempt at some animation, and to say animation, all I really wanted to do was squeeze it to the max, because because I'm using a microcontroller with no uh, auxiliary memory for storing an image, I've actually generated the image in real time, and I say an image, it's a completely random set of colours. Uh, well, I'll turn it on, you can see. Oh, this is going to look so flickery. Let's turn the, let's take the exposure off and like, okay. Oh, that is very glary. Okay, my, my apologies if you get nausea here watching that. So what I'm doing here is I'm using a linear feedback shift register. And for every single line and parallel, both the top block and the bottom block, I'm shifting data along uh, from one end to the other. And then I'm scanning down to the next. That while that line is displaying, I'm already filling the next line with data, a continuation of that shift register. Which uh, it's a linear feedback shift register. It's basically it's a, it's a shift register with feedback, but with logic applied. So it creates a random pattern, and you'll see that there are pairs of the pattern scrolling up this just because the way I've done it in different colours, and they actually gradually move up the screen as they scroll across as well. And um, I fill each line in return, and then I reseed the randomizer right back to the beginning. So all this data is being generated in real time, which means you are seeing a very slight shimmer there. That's just, it's you know it really eats the processing cycles when you have to generate the image not just in real time, but as you multiplex as well. It really does consume the capabilities of the processor. And what I'm doing then, I've uh, I shift in the linear feedback shift register, reseed it to start again, and then when it goes on to the next frame of the animation, it will repeat that several times, then it goes on to the next frame, I increment the shift register, and then I restore the seed, so it's now one step further across. And it creates this really, it's kind of swamping out in the camera. This is it slowed down as well, it can go really fast. Um, this is it at speed 10. At speed 7, um, it was just blurring across the camera. Um, I could see the effect, but the camera wasn't picking up that sort of the sweep of colour across it. Possibly down to compression, uh, and particularly when I, I tried uploading it to YouTube, and uh, it caused slight issues with the compression there again. So I'm going to uh, I'm going to turn the light up before Ebdy gets uh, before Ebdy gets the heebie-jeebies with uh, this continuous scrolling pattern, and I'm going to turn it off so that flickering is not visible because uh, yeah the multiplexing took a real dive, the speed of the multiplexing, because, well, as I say, you're, you're trying to, you're doing significant processing to generate the identical random data for every single line at a time as it's scanning it. I shall put this code off as well, just for your entertainment. Uh, let's see which... Uh, I managed to cram it down. This is the scrolling effect, so... Looking at the, let's say I take the exposure off here a bit. 
you can download this and take a look yourself. I've documented it well just to actually try and make it easier to understand, but it is assembly code. I'd like to point out that you can get uh, Arduino routines for driving this and various other, I think the Raspberry Pi can also, you can also get the routines for driving it. But they have that limitation that it is very data hungry because it is being multiplexed in real time. So what I've got here is uh, I've got the, I've made a note of which pins are going to which of the microcontroller with basically speaking port B uh, is doing the red, green, blue one, red, green, blue two, clock and latch and the port A is being used for the multiplex. It says multiplex D here, it's reserved for a 69 scan. I've not got one of those panels, haven't been able to try it. And it's got the output enable on A7. I shuffled that one about quite a bit while I was writing the software. Then it uh, defines some variables, but after that, the code itself is just one and a half pages to actually implement the linear feedback shift register and put that data out into the multiplexing with the multiplexing handled by software as well. But as I say, there's no point trying to describe this now. You can download it and you can take a look at it and uh, see for yourself what's involved. But the back of this, take a look at the back. The, another interesting thing is that you've got, I know that uh, from looking at this, the thermal imaging camera, the outer chips of these shift registers, LED drivers, were the hottest and they're doing the red LEDs because what they've done is that be, they, to match the intensities, these LEDs are actually only being run at 20 milliamps, the red ones are anyway, and you think, well, 20 milliamps is quite a lot for an LED, but keep in mind that it's only on for an eighth of a time. So uh, the 20 milliamps is spreading across uh, the eight channels, and it means that if something goes horribly wrong, you lose the multiplexing, the LEDs, if they were stuck on, say, at full white, it's not going to grill them too quickly. Um, theoretically, they could hopefully stay at that because the, the green and the blue are even lower current. Um, so that's quite a nice feature because it means that if you're writing software and you lose the multiplexing, unlike uh, in some other systems that had quite aggressive multiplexing, they'd really overdrive the LEDs to get maximum intensity. And if the multiplexing stopped, it stopped scanning it just stuck in one line. It would start blowing the LEDs really quickly and tungsten lamps and the, the old tungsten multiplexing systems. The old, uh, the old slot machines in the UK, the fruit machines, uh, multiplex tungsten lamps on their displays, and they used to absolutely blow the hell out of the lamps if their multiplexing stopped. All it took was the processor crashing or a multiplex drive transistor jamming on, and it would really, it would just pop the lamps instantly. But in this case, it's not an issue because you can just display a full line of white and it, it's not going to grill it. The red LEDs have been chosen, obviously, as they've pushed them to the max. They've run them at 20 milliamps, but the green to match the intensity so that when they're all on at, fu uh, all on at their uh, full setting, they produce the perfect white. What they've done is they've run the reds at the highest because they're the least efficient colour. They've run the greens at only... Um, 8 milliamps each instead of 20, and the blues are the lowest current. They're only about 6 milliamps. So if I like this whole panel at red, it comes in about just over an amp at 5 volts. Um, if I light it green, it draws 500 milliamps, and if I light it blue, it draws 400 milliamps. It is designed for looking at. It's not designed for lighting walls. It does light the room quite well, but it, you couldn't use this as a sort of an LED wash light. It really is designed for looking at. So I could tell from the thermal imaging camera that the two outer chips here were the red because they get the hottest because these also limit the current through the LEDs. That is set locally by a resistor next to the chip that sets its current output. So they've, I'm guessing that they went red, green, blue, and then from the other side it was the reverse red, green, blue in the way like that, just from the temperature of the chips. And that way each of these chips is just doing one color um, along that row of pixels. And that's how they sort of uh, they can set the current individually for red, green, and blue. So we get two of those. So each one is obviously doing sixteen pins, sixteen outputs per chip, and then the two per section of the panel then gives the thirty-two LEDs. The MOSFETs are dual MOSFET packages. I'm guessing they're just in parallel, and they're driven off a very simple traditional logic chip. It's really nice. It's very nice. There's also a couple of. Uh, octal bus 
drivers, which I think are actually probably being used to gate the information coming in out from this port because you can cascade them and you can shift data from one panel, I think, I've not got another panel to try this, into the next panel. And normally there'd be another connector here and it would just be linked across. But due to the limitations of the multiplexing, that's why the video wall modules, you just tend to get a block with a, a smallish number of these panels and then the dedicated controller at the back that is designed, it's a mass-produced item again, that uh, connects to a series of these and just shifts the data across them in a, as a sort of predefined clump of panels. Very nice, very neat. Much simpler than I was expecting. And uh, this uh, is... Technically speaking, if you made a little inline connector for this and you made a little circuit board or even just hardwired this onto another connector, I ended up just tacking it onto the board. Technically speaking, you could um, just plug this into the back of a board uh, and it would do the full self-test with this uh, bit of software I wrote for testing them. I'm not sure how useful that would be, but you know, it was quite fun writing it. But they're, they're very interesting much simpler than I was expecting and uh, quite fun just to try and see what you can squeeze out a microcontroller uh, on its own, creating that information in real time. To actually do a coloured image, keep in mind that there are, well let's get the calculator, there are 32 pixels wide times 16 equals, so 512 pixels and there's three LEDs in each, so this panel actually has over 1,500 LEDs on it. And if you wanted to uh, create an image on this uh, old school sort of like, uh, this takes me back to designing sprites for my DIY video games for the ZX Spectrum. You'd actually, one byte, you'd have to use three bytes per uh, eight LEDs, one with red, one with uh, green, one with blue. And you'd actually have to have a big block of memory to actually store that image and then maybe shift that out, uh, rotating each of those files around, uh, clocking the data out from its uh, from one end of it onto the display in sort of real time. And then you'd have to just keep doing that. As I say, it wouldn't store an image. You'd have to, the software would spend all its time scanning that while trying to generate the image and push it out. All very interesting. Very neat. Uh, it just makes you think differently. I've seen... All the video walls, all I ever really see is video wall modules. I've never actually realised that what's inside them is so traditional, if you will, that it's not got much intelligence. It is basically those shift registers and the multiplexing is being done by a bit of clever hardware in the back that receives the video signal sent out and then converts it into the format and scans these in, in real time to create the image. Very neat. Anything else worth mentioning? Not really. I shall put the code, uh, I'll link to it down below in the description. Uh, I shall put the code up, I've stripped it down and made it really lean. Um, I'll put the hex files up as well, so you can just copy it into a chip if you want to play about with it and just see what it looks like. But I'll also put the assembly files so you can actually play about and read them and uh, swap values and stuff like that. But very neat, a lot of fun playing with this. Bonus extra footage for those of you who had the patience to stay to the end of that rambly video. If you remove this chip, uh, and say for instance you just simply do not have uh, any sort of chip programming stuff, but maybe you bought one of these video wall modules and you just wanted to have instant gratification, all you need to do is supply 5 volts to this connector in the back here. It, if it, you got it out the same sort of kid's toy I got mine from, then it will already have... Uh, a couple of wires onto that. And if I turn the power on now, let's uh, get the power supply on here, turn the power on, then it will just display flickering mess. And if you run your fingers over, you can actually inject data onto this just basically as electrical noise because your fingers are, it's picking up the mains hum off your fingers and it, it's interpreting it as data. It's, what, just watch you don't zap it with static or anything like that. But uh, by sort of running your fingers over the clock latch and data pins, you can get some quite interesting sort of visual effects on it. Basically like a malfunctioning video wall, which is coincidentally exactly what happens in the malfunctioning video walls when uh, they are just getting garbled data and uh, it just ends up displaying gibberish like this.
but I have to say it's strangely therapeutic just running your fingers over the connectors. In the case of the raw unit, uh, you'd just be putting your finger in these terminals here at the back and uh, injecting the noise with your fingers. It's quite pleasing. Yeah, if you've got one of these and you're not going to do anything else with it, this is definitely the one thing you should do because it is strangely therapeutic. And you can't really damage the panel because even if you do jam one line of pixels on, uh, it doesn't really matter because uh, it's not going to overdrive the display. Another thing worth mentioning, it doesn't have to be quite 5 volts. Uh, this thing will run right down to... Let's uh, stick the chip back in again. Let's put my... Uh, Let's put the uh, test bar chip in. Have I just snapped a lead? No, I don't think I've just snapped a pin off. If you put this in and we start displaying the uh, test, we can actually I can run the intent, run the voltage way down to the point that just the red LEDs are lit. It, it works right down to literally, at the moment, the bench supply is displaying 1.5 volts, because that's what the microcontroller is running at. And this display just seems to run at that. I mean, all, all you're getting is the red LEDs because they're the only ones that can light at that voltage level. And as you turn it up, then the green gradually comes in and then the blue. So uh, you could have a lot of fun just playing about with this just uh, without any electronic circuitry at all, which makes it even more worth getting one of those cheap plastic handbag toys. Although that said, these panels, it turns out, are not that expensive. You can get them for around about 10 or 20 quid depending on how many you're buying. So uh, pretty neat, nice toys.